bearing fruit. And Lord, we just thank you again for this ministry. We thank you for the leadership, O oh God, and pray that your anointing, your wisdom, your insight, your discernment, your discretion, O oh God, knowledge, O oh Lord, would increase in the leadership that they might guide this ministry in the way that it should go. And Lord, we just thank you again for those, Lord, who, who, um, who are sick right now and, uh, and shut in. And we just pray, God, that your presence and your power would be present in the room, Lord, where they live, where they exist, where they're staying. And Lord God, that something miraculous would happen in the midst to surprise the doctors, the nurses, the attenders, everybody. Because you're still God. You're still powerful. You still heal. In fact, you introduced yourself as the healer because you want us to know that that's what you want to do. And so I pray, Father, that our lives line up with what makes it easy, oh God, for you to do miracles for us. And so we thank you for this now. We ask now and invite the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him would be active in each one of us tonight, Lord. And we thank you, Father. We thank you for those that are watching um, by, by stream or YouTube or whatever. God, we just invite your presence there that they will have the same sensation of your presence that we do here. And so for that, Father, we just thank you now for our time together with you. We willingly sit at your feet to learn from you. Bless us now in Jesus' name we ask. And everybody in agreement said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, we will be starting on page 86 in your study guide and uh, chapter 5 of First Peter. Praise the Lord. All right, page 86 of your study guide. I pray that those of you that are viewing uh, have a copy or you get a copy. We're almost concluding the book. Um, and so it's not too late, but it's late. <laughs> Amen. But you can order the book through the bookstore here at the Wynn. Uh, so thank you very much for your attentiveness. And we also would like to know if you're watching uh, some kind of way, let us know that you're watching. Um, it would be great. And if you live within driving distance, we certainly invite you to come and be a part of what we're doing here. Uh, it does make a difference to be present. And uh, so I know sometimes we work long hours, long days, and just don't feel like driving. But there's something reinvigorating, something about the Holy Spirit who touches our bodies and our lives even when we're here and, and tired and fatigued, that uh, we forget all about that as we sit around the Word of God. So come if you can, come if you will. All righty, be blessed, and uh, let's get started. First Peter chapter 5, verse 1, and if you have a study guide, page 86 uh, in your study guide. All right. I want to start with the first question on page 86, and the question is, at this point in Peter's book, letter or epistle, however you want to address this book, who, <coughs> who is being addressed? First Peter chapter 5, verse 1, who is being addressed? Microphone, if you have a comment. Who is being addressed? First Peter chapter 5, verse 1. Right. Microphone. Turn it on. See the green light. This is the elders. Okay. That's what it says. That must be what it is. Amen. Notice again, Peter is addressing the elders. So what he's getting ready to say in the next couple of verses is re specifically referring to elders. All right. Okay. And so... Um, <coughs> Uh, an elder, um, uh, let me see, in some churches, um, the elder is, um, it is a position, a title, and in some cases it may be even an office in the church. Um, when, when, the, when the elders were first appointed, these churches were young churches, they were baby infant churches, and so they didn't have time to do a bunch of organizational structure uh, and raising up leaders and so forth. And so by the Spirit, I believe um, the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the discernment to recognize, you know, who was mature 
and who was, uh, you know, uh, elderly uh, and mature, elderly and mature, and set them kind of as overseers over these small house churches. There were no mega churches back then, all right? So these small house churches are groups all over the city, and, uh, and so they would appoint these elders. So initially, it was a senior citizen, a mature senior citizen, a fatherly figure, a fatherly figure. Okay, that's kind of what the elder was in the beginning. Later on, uh, it began to, as the churches grew and as the churches began to mature, then this elder became a position, a title in the church, and, um, and they became uh, overseers. And so uh, bishops, elders, uh, pastors, uh, apostles are overseers of the church. Uh, that's what it became. Uh, originally, uh, the apostle was a lowercase a. Because if you stop and think about it, these apostles were disciples who had been with Jesus, had been trained by Jesus, had been mentored by Jesus, and then he sent them out. And that's what the word apostle means, a sent one, one who is being sent. So it's the recognition of, of gifts and callings in a person's life. Training must take place first. Mentorship should take place first or discipleship. And then they are sent out by the leadership of the church. All right. That's what an apostle uh, was. And, and I would even say is. So if you really look at the word apostle in the lower case, lower case A, uh, in Matthew 28, Jesus gave a commission and a commandment. Anybody tell me what that was? Give me a microphone. Give me a microphone. Give me a microphone. Speak into the microphone. Go and preach the word to everyone. Okay, go and preach the word to everyone. Who was he saying that to originally? The disciples. To the disciples, all right. Do you think that that applies to us today? Huh? How come is nobody's going? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding, but I'm kidding. Okay. So technically, every believer is a sent one. Hello. Y'all with me? Yeah, just tell, tell your neighbor, uh, in case you didn't know, you are a sent one. Tell your neighbor. T tell me. <laughs> I am a sent one. Okay, so the lowercase a for apostle is a sent one, someone who is recognized, trained, taught, mentored, discipled, and then sent. All right? It later became, again, this office in the church, and unfortunately, the way it was in the beginning is not necessarily the way it was today. Now, the Bible does tell us in, in the book of Ephesians that the church was built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets. Okay, again, these apostles were disciples who had been mentored by Jesus and then sent out. They're disciples, first and foremost, and they had been sent out by Christ. Okay, and, and prophets, again, that's not an Old Testament prophet. You have to remember, what, what's the backdrop of these statements, of these phrases that we read in the Bible? They didn't have a completed canon of the scripture, a Bible. They didn't have that in the early church. So the Holy Spirit would speak through the apostles and through the prophets to the members of the church. They would go somewhere and preach. People would get saved. A church would be born. And then they would stay there and do some teaching and training. Then they would move on to the next uh, location. All right. So that's how the church got started. It wasn't until years and years later that the Bible was actually in print. OK, um, <clears throat> so you have to understand when people who 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 want this title of prophet get a hold of that. Well, the church is built on the foundation of the prophets, you know what I mean? And they elevate themselves. Apostles today elevate themselves above everybody else. And from that point on, it's talking down to everybody else. They're up here. Everybody else is down here. That is not the way it was intended to be in the beginning. All right. You just need to understand that. 
I hope whoever l ever looks at this will search the scriptures for real, get the backdrop of some of this stuff, the you know, the meaning of some of this stuff, and then, you know, hopefully we can correct it. I don't know because it's so out of control now. It's just, it is what it is. And if people don't ever grow up and learn this kind of stuff, they, they won't know to hold these people accountable. They'll keep following these folks who keep elevating themselves above everybody else in the church, and it was never intended for that. All right? And I'm going to show you some scriptures here before we leave here tonight that will prove that. Okay? All right. So, <clears throat> so Peter, the apostle, is talking to the elders. All right? And so uh, the, the italicized uh, statement there underneath question number one on page 86 says, what is important for all of us to understand is that the word of God is what? Page 86. Right there at the top. The italicized words. The word of God is impartial. <laughs> it speaks to all of us. Do you all see that? Okay, mark that. <laughs> it is impartial. It speaks to all of us. Okay. Now. Uh, define the word elder. Okay, I've almost already done that, <clears throat> so you got a free answer, which I hate doing. But anyway, uh, it's a, a man advanced in years who is mature and a father figure. A man who is advanced in years who is mature and is a father figure. These were the men that the apostles appointed over the church to be overseers. And later on, again, um, it, it became an official, um, uh, an official uh, title or office, if you want to call it that. <clears throat> and the duties was to exercise spiritual oversight and authority over the members. Okay, to exercise spiritual oversight and authority over the members. You have to have somebody who's in charge of a church. Lest everybody does whatever makes sense to them. Everybody might not like leadership, but you have to have it. And a leader can't be afraid to confront, to challenge, to correct, to rebuke if necessary. All of those things. Because it's what helps to keep the church in order. All right? You can't be, you can't be weak as a, as a pastor. Because people will challenge you all day long, and if not, if you're not careful, they'll take over your church. So you you can't be that. All right. So so this elder again. Now if let's let's turn to Acts chapter twenty, Acts chapter twenty, real quick. Acts chapter twenty. Acts chapter twenty. Acts chapter twenty. Twenty twenty. Verse seventeen, and we'll we'll begin reading. Acts chapter 20, verse 17. Everybody there? Here we go. From Miletus, this is Paul the Apostle. From Miletus, which is one of the, the islands that he, he uh, traveled in one of his journeys, missionary journeys, he sent to Ephesus and called for the who? Elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, that's where Ephesus is, Asia Minor. In what manner I always lived among you. So right there, it tells me that elders, there is a higher expectation of how we live, how we live as examples to the flock. Right there. You watched how I lived before you. Okay? So we as regular church members have a right to expect a higher quality of life and example from those who lead us. Amen? Amen anyhow. Praise the Lord. If you don't say it, it's the truth anyhow. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Verse 19 says, serving the Lord. Pa pa here's, here's the Apostle Paul saying, you watched how I lived before you. And then he says in verse 19, serving the Lord. How? With all humility, he was not there to puff himself up, 
or to be the apostle of all time. You understand? But he was there to serve the Lord with all humility. Listen, with many tears. What? Do you see apostles crying today? Bishops crying today? I don't know. Many trials and, excuse me, many tears and trials with which happened to me by, by the plotting of the Jews. And verse 20 says, now I kept back nothing that was helpful. I wasn't trying to just tell you enough to keep dependent upon me. Paul says, I told you everything. Why? Because I want you to grow up. I want you to become mature. I want you to understand what it is that God is calling you to do and to be. Okay? I didn't hold anything back that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly how? Y'all looking at your Bible? Thank you. Somebody talk to me tonight. All right? House to house, not convention hall to convention hall, not conference center to conference center, right? From house to house. When is the last time you've seen or heard of an apostle going to a small group setting where there's maybe five to ten people gathered together. It's just not a normal thing that we see today in America. And so again, this is all of this that we're going to talk about tonight has everything to do with us understanding who these leaders are and how they should function. And, and not with all of this arrogance and pride and, 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 you know, it's all about me and all that stuff. Paul says in humility, okay, uh, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So, so that, that's one. Uh, verse 28. Turn to verse 28. Same chapter. Therefore, take heed to yourself and to all the flock. Pay attention to what you do. Pay attention to your disposition. I'm in verse 28. It's right there. Okay? Take heed. Pay attention to your disposition. Pay attention to what you do and how you do. In other words, you should be serving the flock just like I do. That's what he's saying. All right? Pay attention to yourself and to the flock among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To do what? Shepherd the church, to shepherd the church, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. All right? So, so uh, uh, again, ministry is serious. Oversight of a church is very serious. The next verse says, for I know that after my departure, what's going to happen? Savage wolves are going to come in among you, not sparing the flock. So part of the shepherd's oversight is to watch the sheep, to pay attention to who's coming in the door, to pay attention to who's talking to my sheep, who's trying to influence them, who's trying to get them to come visit their church or their ministry. Do you think that's too much reach? Not for people who don't really understand all of the stuff that's involved. It's about protecting now, sheep, if you know anything about sheep, they just put their head down and they start chewing. And they keep going in the direction as long as there's something to chew on. Even if the end of that chewing is going to lead them off a cliff, they don't have sense enough to turn around and not fall off the cliff. And so we're, we're like sheep. And it's the job of the overseer to protect the sheep, to guard them. All right? So, uh, so anyway... To what degree people do that, it varies from person to person and church to church. All right. Okay, turn back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. You can, you can ask a question at any point in time if there's something that you don't quite understand. Uh, just raise your hand and pick up the microphone and say what you need to say. Say it loud so they can hear you all around the world. All right. We don't have no shy people in here, right? I guess all of y'all are shy because nobody said nothing. We have no shy people in here, right? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> ah, okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> so define the word exhort. 
says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1, to the elders who are among you, I exhort. What does the word exhort mean? Encourage. What else? Huh? Why don't you pick up the microphone so we can all hear you and they can hear you around the world. Comfort. Comfort. What else? To give aid. To give aid. To urge. To urge. Urge. Okay. Anything else? Is it green? Yeah. Put, okay. Cheer up or build up. Okay. To lift. To cheer up. To lift up. To build up. Simplest definition. To cheer up to lift up, and to build up. It also means to warn, W-A-R-N, warn people. And one last word, it means to instruct, to give instructions, because that's what Peter is doing to the elders here in 1 Peter 5. All right, so it means all of this. You see all of these different little facets of the word exhort. Okay? All right, it does not mean pounce upon somebody's head, right, and, and, and prophesy all these negative things about them. It doesn't necessarily mean that. But if somebody's strong-willed and stiff-necked and hard-hearted as a believer, and then the exhortation comes to you, it's going to be a warning. Straighten up or you're going to get a spanking. And nobody wants to hear that. We want to hear you about to come into a bunch of money. You're going to get that big old house you ever wanted. You're going to get the car and the bling you've always wanted and all this other stuff you've always wanted. That's that's kind of stuff that, that goes forward. But anyhow, so based upon the definition, I'm still on page 86 in the italicized words, based upon the definition of the word exhort, it appears that even elders are not exempt from being called, implored, or to be instructed. See, see the elders are not above that. But in some uh, um, denominations, you can't talk to an elder. You certainly can't correct them. Because they're up here and everybody else is down here. And you don't have a right to correct me. Don't you know who I am? And so it's this pride and arrogance that is, that is rampant in America with people who carry, not everybody, but pe some people who carry this title. I'm so glad that here, locally in our church, you don't, you don't see this kind of attitude, and that's something that we need to be thankful for, okay? But out there, I've been out there. I've been a whole lot of places out there, and I know what's going on, and so I'm not making this stuff up, okay? And I'm not overkilling on this. This, this is probably more the norm than it is the exception, exception. All right. So how did Peter recognize himself to these elders in verse 1? up the microphone okay over here a fellow elder pardon me a fellow elder a what a fellow elder now wait a minute this is the apostle peter the apostle peter is identifying himself as a fellow elder hmm. again this is not the norm not today it's not <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm the elder, I'm the bishop, I'm the overseer, I'm I'm the it. And so they 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 walk around, amen, like Pharisees, many of them. And so you're supposed to look up to them, amen, and bow down to them and praise them and all of this other stuff, all this special treatment. Special treatment belongs to everybody in the body of Christ. The Bible says do good to everybody, but especially those who are of the household of faith. Are you the household of faith? All right, tell somebody, treat me special now. All right, T treat me special. If you didn't treat me special, you're missing it. Okay, that's, that's it. All right, so Peter again identifies himself as a fellow apostle, a fellow elder. This is amazing. Th this, is, this is the apostle Peter, the man, the only one who ever walked on water, along with Jesus. But he's not, He's not stuck on pride, okay? And and, and this is, um, let, let me hold off until that next point until I get to that. Keep working. All right, 
So, so Peter recognized himself as a, as a fellow elder, all right? Is, is there any difference between the elders then and the elders today? What do you think? Hmm? I hear mumbling. I don't hear answers. Is that a yes or no? Or I don't know. Okay, that's honest, okay? <laughs> there is a difference between those elders today and those elders back then. Okay, now this is going to lead to the next question and the point I want to make. At the top of page 87, it says, Peter was one of the original apostles. Yet what do you recognize from his approach with these elders? What is it about Peter that we can see as he's calling himself a fellow elder? What, what word comes to mind? He was humble. There you go. Right on the point. Humility. Humility. Now, the point I want to make is <laughs> these, these disciples knew where they came from before Jesus called them. He called them to be with him. He trained them. He mentored them. He discipled them. He raised them up. He delegated authority to them and sent them out to do work. They, they, listen, they knew that they didn't get this stuff on their own. It didn't go to their heads. That's why all of the letters in the New Testament, again, have this lowercase A for apostle, lowercase E for the word elder, lowercase B for the word bishop, lowercase, because these folks were not trying to be proud and arrogant. They knew better. But today... People, this stuff, all of these titles go straight to the head. I know bishops, I know, I, listen, I know personally, I know some bishops who don't even have a church. I know some bishops who might have a church, but it might be 10 people, 10, maybe 20 people in their church, but they're bishops. Okay? I, I'm actually, I have the privilege of, of working with four bishops right now in four different states. Now, 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 it's a privilege and an honor for me. They will refer to me, but I'm thinking to myself, bishops are supposed to know what bishops are supposed to do before they get appointed. And so how is it they get appointed to be a bishop and they don't know what they're supposed to do? H Hello, y'all with me tonight? Yeah, they don't, they don't know. What, some of them don't know what to do. And, 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 then, and so, I, I, you know, I've asked a couple of them, so, so how did you get appointed as a bishop? And they said, well, you know, I, I served uh, at my pastor's side, and he saw that I was loyal and committed, and so he made me a bishop. I said, well, now, that's something new. <laughs> made you a bishop because you served by his side. You was loyal. A bishop over what? Well, I, I, don't, I don't know. I said, oh, okay. So, so. There's some strange stuff going on in the church. It's, it's been happening for a minute. But, but to me, again, why would you appoint a bishop at that level of oversight, not been trained, not been discipled, don't understand some of the basic things? I've had pastors call me and say, Pastor, how do you do communion service? They're already pastors. How do you do a wedding? How do you do a funeral? How do you do a, a you know, just all of the, 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 the duties that a minister is supposed to do? I've had pastors call me and ask me how to do that. They already pastor in the church. Who put you there and didn't teach you and train you how to do what it is you're supposed to be doing? And so there are a lot of, they, they, not a lot, there are some pastors and leaders in churches who don't know how to train. They, they don't know how. So they don't do it. They say, watch me. Because that's what they were told when they was coming up. Watch me. The first church, when I got saved and got called to the ministry, that's what I was told. What, just watch me. Okay. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'm watching. So um, so there's some strange stuff going on in the church. It, it, it's a miracle that the church is still in existence today. It really is a miracle. And it's because Jesus is committed to building his church. That's why it's still around. 
Because if it was really and truly left into the hands of men, it'd be messed up for sure. Okay? All right. So humility is what we recognize about Peter. Humility. And all of the apostles were humble. That's why you didn't have that uppercase A and that uppercase E or the uppercase B for bishop. That's why you don't have it. Because they weren't trying to push themselves. They were there to preach Christ and him crucified. It wasn't about them. It was about shepherding the flock. Hello? See, if you don't know, yes, ma'am. Microphone. As elders, this is what they supposed to do. I got a whole list of stuff we're gonna talk about tonight. However, <laughs> if they don't do it, we're also responsible because if we're not getting the teaching that we're supposed to get, then we're not supposed to hang around that group of people. <coughs> That's kind of a yes and a no answer. Um, I will say this, that ultimately I'm responsible for my growth. But I cannot neglect the people that God has placed over me, the overseers. Uh, they're there for a reason. Um, and like I said, some of the people that I'm working with um, around the country, they, some of them have an inkling of what they're supposed to be doing. Some don't, and they're just trying to wing it. They're trying to remember what they saw their pastor do, and they're trying to just copy that. Uh, so there's a variety of approaches to ministry. It doesn't make a ministry or the overseer bad. It just means that there are different approaches. People don't realize that there are different kind of pastors. Did y'all know that? We think that the word pastor covers everything, but not necessarily. There are evangelistic pastors. There are um, <clears throat> shepherding pastors. There are um, um, entrepreneurial pastors. There are administrative pastors. So, so there's at least four different kinds of pastors. But we don't know that because nobody says this. And so we just assume that a pastor is a full pastor. But each pastor, depending on which which vein or which, which, which bent or gift they have, that's how they're going to maneuver the church. If it was an evangelistic pastor, we'd be out there in them streets all the time. But administrative pastors, entrepreneurial pastors, and, 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 and all of that, you know, a shepherd pastor wants to kind of keep everybody huddled up real tight, you know, so it's easier to keep an eye on everybody and, and make sure the wolf don't get to them and all that kind of stuff. So, so there's just a variation of, of, of flavor of pastors. And uh, like I said, some might not be aware of this. Some might be aware of it. I don't know. So it's, it's, it's not that we just, you know, pack up and run. We, we don't do that. Uh, if, if we are submitted to God, then God is the one who tells us to come and to go. If he's not saying go, we don't go. If he's not saying come, we don't come. You understand? So we get our directions from him and not... Uh, left to our own understanding. Um, I've been in a, three different churches uh, before and um, was misunderstood at all three of those churches, but I didn't pack up and leave because of the way I felt. I knew that I had to wait for God's signal and release. And that's what I did. So whatever I had to deal with while I was there, I had to deal with it. It was going to make me stronger and wiser and all this other stuff. So it added to me as a person in my development. If I had left, I would have missed out on what phase of my development that was supposed to speak to me. Does that make sense to anybody? Okay. So, so we have to be careful about that. And, and um, we don't want to be quick to judge, and, uh, and all, we don't want to do that either. Uh, because you can only, and this goes for any one of us, you can only give away what you have. Hello? We all want to think that we, we, we probably are more advanced than what we are. We're more mature. We're more knowledgeable of the word. We're more every, every, everything. And maybe that may be true for some, and it may not be completely true for others. And so, you know, we, we have to 
we have to just kind of get our signals from the Lord. That's that's where it comes from. And he has a reason for for a long stay or short stay. He has the reason. But we should not move based upon how we feel. Don't do that. All right? Okay. So I do have a question regarding that little bit later on. Uh, so, so anyway, and it's not from a judgmental standpoint, from an observation standpoint. And the purpose for it is if I don't know these things as a member, then I won't know what to expect of my leaders. Does that make sense? Right. So, <coughs> so um, leaders should be given to the very things that we're talking about. And like I said, there's a list of things we're going to talk about tonight uh, so that we understand what the job description of, of, of an overseer is as a pastor, a bishop, uh, an elder, or, or even an apostle. So it'll make us wiser, and and then it will also um, allow us uh, the 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 awareness in how to approach those who lead us, who may not be you know who may be lacking in one or two areas or whatever. Yeah. Okay. And so, what if God has you there and you're seeing what you see, because He wants you to do something. See, I believe every every believer is a minister. Every believer is a minister. Some just don't know it yet. Every one of us, right? So if I'm if I'm you know overly um, uh, dependent upon uh, any particular leader in the church, then that says something about me. There needs to be some further development on my part. So, okay, so Peter recognizes, introduces himself as a fellow elder. That, that's, that's one. And what we see of his life is humility because a person with pride and arrogance would have never considered himself equal with another elder or another overseer. They, they don't, you don't hear him do that. All right. How else does Peter identify himself in verse 1? As a witness. Huh? As a witness. As a witness. Okay, he identifies himself as a witness. As a witness. Um, <clears throat> now, this, 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 this word witness here is more specifically an eyewitness. Not something somebody told him or he heard it from somewhere or he saw it from a distance. This is somebody who's up close and personal, somebody who has seen it. P Peter is saying, as an elder, as an elder, I've seen some stuff. I've been in the middle of some stuff. I was right there with Christ during all of this stuff that he was going through. So I'm not getting my information from somebody else or somewhere else. All right? And so, again, if, if uh, P Peter literally is being called as an eyewitness uh, um, uh, to give testimony of the life of Jesus Christ, that, that's what he means when he says, I'm a witness. This is not just some easy thing where, you know, I, 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 you know, I saw something and so I, I, can, I have a little bit to say. Peter says, I was there. I was there. Okay. Now, what was he an eyewitness of? Verse 1. All the answers are right there in the Bible. Verse 1. Give me a microphone. Okay, right up here. The suffering of Christ. Okay. Peter was an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ. He was right there. He saw it. He saw how they treated him. Excuse me, mistreated him. And especially after he had done all of the miracles that he did to make people's lives better by the thousands. And yet, look at how they treated him. Uh, I, I was just looking at the, the movie, The Bible, the other night. I think it was a day or two before uh, uh, Sunday. And, um, and again, at the end, when they had to choose between Barabbas and, and Christ, they, they chose Barabbas. They chose a thief. They didn't choose a per person who had just blessed their lives and changed their lives and fed them and healed them 
and delivered them from demonic possession. They, did, they didn't choose him. They chose Barabbas. Isn't that interesting? Does that strike you as interesting, that they chose Barabbas instead of Jesus? That lets you know that people will love you one moment and hate you the next. Okay? They'll love you one moment, but they'll hate you the next. So do you stop because somebody hates you or don't like you? No. If God calls you to do something, you, that's your commitment. It doesn't matter how people treat you. You got to keep doing what Jesus said to do, period. All right. I, I hope y'all got that. So Peter was an eyewitness, amen, to the suffering of Christ. So Peter didn't hear about it. No. Next question. Was he an eyewitness to what Jesus went through? Yes. The next question, page 87, did Peter actually experience what Christ experienced? I'm going to see if you're going to change your mind when I show you a scripture. <laughs> All right. Now, was, was Peter, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll wait till we get to the scripture. I'm going to show you in just a second. Okay, question, uh, Hans, go ahead. The answer is no. He's an eyewitness. He did not hear it, but he witnessed it by, by, by himself. Okay. All so right. Uh, hold your position. And when I show you the scripture, Let's see if you're going to change your mind. Okay. <laughs> That's the obvious answer as far as this immediate context is concerned. You're right that he didn't suffer the exact same suffering that Jesus went through. They didn't nail him to a cross or, or, or beat him with 40 lashes and things like that. We don't know exactly to what degree he might have suffered some persecution, but I'm going to show you in just a second. All right. All right. Take, Nate, be patient. Okay. All right. Um. <coughs> Who would be the most credible witness? Bottom question on page 87. Who would be the most credible witness? The one who heard it, the one who saw it, or the one who experienced it personally? Who would be the most credible witness? I need a microphone. Okay, right here in front. The one who experienced it because he feels it, you know. It's like you could say, like, for example, okay, Food in McDonald's is good, but without tasting, you cannot tell if it's really good. Right. That's right. That's why the Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, once you taste the good word of God, now you, you are an eyewitness that is good. But if you don't taste it, the word, if you don't experience the word, then you'll never know how good it is. You can go to church the rest of your life. But if you don't taste and experience the word of God in your life, you won't know how good it is. You won't know how beneficial it is. So, so the, the, the greater witness is the person who has experienced the stuff. Everybody with me? Okay. All right. Page, top of page 88 in your study guide. This is what the more comprehensive definition of an eyewitness is, okay, what we just talked about. So again, in verse 1, notice it mentions the sufferings of Christ. What does that suggest to you and me? The sufferings of Christ. What does that imply to you and me? What comes to mind? Some of you all might be thanking it, but you don't want to say it. There's no, there's no real wrong answer. You could be wrong, but it's, this is a safe place, so it's, it's safe to be wrong here. That we will suffer? Yes, there you go. See, I know you're thanking it, but y'all looking at me. Okay, just, just say it. Take a shot. All right? You may get it right. So this implies that Christ suffered, Peter suffered, the apostle Paul suffered, all of the apostles suffered. You'll see that in a second. All of them suffered, okay? And if it ha and and it's happened in every generation of Christianity. Every generation. But we think here in America that we're not going to go through anything. Or we don't want to go through anything. Look, nobody wants to go through it. But God has a purpose in allowing suffering. We looked at that last week. 
in the week before. God has a purpose in it. We may not like it. It may not feel good or us be comfortable, but he has a purpose in it. And so do we trust God about that or with that or not? So do I only trust him when everything is going well in my life? When I can calculate everything? When I can figure everything out? Is that when I trust God? Somebody told me the other day, well, you know you got to use common sense. I said, oh, <laughs> how many times has common sense conflicted with what the word of God says? Because faith is not about common sense. Faith is about trusting God no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. So that's, it's not common sense to rejoice when you're suffering. Somebody help me with that. Right? Mm -mm. <laughs> that's not the first thing that comes to your mind. I'm going to rejoice because they whooping my head. <laughs> that's, that's not common sense. No. So common sense is, is for out there. Faith is for in here. You listening? Okay. All right. So, so suffering has happened in every generation of Christianity all around the world. It is currently happening in many countries in our world right now. But for some reason, we here in America, we think we're going to escape. That's why the teaching on the pre-tribulation rapture is so important to people. Because they want to get out of here before the bad stuff happens. So are we better than the Christians who've come before us? You sure about that? So why do we think we're, we're going to escape? And if you're paying attention to the news, you you, you got to see that that persecution for Christianity is 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 alive and well, and it's gaining momentum in our society right today. Okay, keep your eyes open because it's right there before you. All right, now now what follows? Christ did suffer, and Peter was an eyewitness of that. But what follows Christ suffering? Right there in the verse. Microphone. The glory. The what? The glory. Okay, the glory. Say it like you mean it. Amen. It's right there. <laughs> the glory is what follows the suffering. So you can focus on the suffering and be and be messed up still. Your faith will be tore up. You know, you'll be trying to hang on to a thread if if that much. But if you focus on the glory, it makes all the difference in the world. Now, uh, you know, when 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 our two daughters were were being born. Uh, we went to the Lamaze class. Anybody know about the Lamaze class? Y'all don't know about this. Y'all stay away from it as long as you need to. <laughs> it's for pregnant women. And what they do is they teach pregnant women, especially the closer they get to the delivery date, when the pains intensify and they come more often. How do I know that? I ain't never had no baby, but I had a baby. I had two babies. But what they do is they teach you to focus on something other than your pain. It can be a dot on the wall. Did you all hear what I just said? They want you to concentrate on that dot on the wall and breathe. Anybody been to Lamar's class? That's what they tell you. Short breaths, right? But focus on the dot. And I'm telling you, it works. It works. The pain was still there, but because you have a different focus, I'll wait for you guys. Because you, we have a, because the person has a different focus, it tends to minimize the pain. Okay? How you doing, sir? It minimizes the pain when we focus on something else. So if we're going through stuff, if we're going through stuff, then we, we, if we learn to focus on the glory that's awaiting us and not the pain that we're in the middle of, then we'll be able to make it. So get you a dot. Your dot and my dot is the word of God. We focus on that. And it keeps us, it stabilizes us in the whole night. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. Look up here. Praise the Lord. All right. Now. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Romans 8, 17. 
Romans 8, 17. If you get there, say amen. You happen to have a Bible, sir? Okay, pull that phone out and get with us. <laughs> Romans 8, 17. Praise the Lord. 8, 17. And let's see. Verse 16 says, verse 16 first, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we do what? Suffer with him, that we may also be what? Glorified with him. If we suffer with him, we'll be glorified with him. And so we focus on the glory and not the suffering. In fact, it tells us in Philippians chapter 2, that for the joy that was set before Christ, he endured the cross. He was focusing on the joy of, of, of people receiving him as Savior. He was focusing on that while he had to endure the cross. So there's a lesson in there for all of us. What are you focused on when you're going through tough times? If you're focusing on the wrong stuff, it's going to be some really tough times. You're going to think you're not going to be able to make it. But if you focus on the right stuff, you'll be able to make it. Mm. All right. Okay. Then turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Right after Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Verse 9, 4 beginning at verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. I hope everybody's there. Here we go. For I think that God, this is Paul the Apostle Paul, I think that God has displayed us the apostles last, as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the whole world, both to angels and to men. Verse 10 says, we are fools for Christ's sake. Everybody considers us fools for what we're doing because the world is not going to understand our commitment to Christ nor the preaching of the gospel. All right? We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are distinguished, but we are dishonored. Verse 11, to the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. When's the last time you seen a bishop or an apostle hungering and thirsty? Hello? You don't see that today. And this is the apostle, this is the, the apostle Paul says, We was thirsty and hungry. I ain't finished. Look at this. And we were poorly clothed. Y'all see that in your Bible? This is a new King James version of the Bible. So you see that, right? Said we were what? Poorly what? When the last time you seen an elder or apostle or bishop poorly clothed? In fact, many of them are, are, have adopted the attire of Catholic priests. And then they get the big long chain with the big old cross on it, and then they hang the cross and put it in the pocket. Y'all seen that? Okay. <laughs> and then, don't forget the bishop ring. The bishop ring, and, and they flash it all over the place, big old round stone of some kind, and so make sure that you see it, because they want everybody to know who I am, but this is so far removed from what Paul is saying was the life and experience of apostles. Everybody up here, 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 all right? So, again, how do we, how do we gauge, how do we monitor, uh, 
those who are in leadership today, the word of God helps us to see this. When we know this stuff, then we can we can gauge, we can maneuver, we can know what's going on and what to look for, what to look out for, and things like that. If we don't know this, then we'll be like, you know, we'll just be gullible, and, and if somebody preaches real good, we're right there. We, we don't care about what they stand for or what's, what, what's going on in their life. We just, we're right there. But it's the word of God that matures us so that we know how to think, how to behave, you understand, how to follow, and in some cases, how to lead. That, that's it. So, so, so this is what Paul is saying. And then he says, verse 12, but look, look at this. Wait a minute. He says, not, verse 11, not only were we poorly clothed, but beaten and homeless. When last time you seen an elder or apostle or bishop homeless? Hel- Wait a minute. Hello? Some of them got mansions with helicopters and airplanes, <laughs> private jets. Does that, does that sound like a biblical apostle? Oh, my God. And and people just continue to follow, 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 giving up all that money and all that kind of stuff. And for what? Because they have set themselves up here as if they're the only ones who are called by God to preach the gospel around the world. That's a joke. But nobody challenges that because they don't know what this book says. Verse 12. And we labored working with our own hands. Some of these folks don't work. They just go from church to church putting their hand in your pocket. That's about the work that they do. They get your money. They get you to give your money, and they don't have to work. And they really are becoming more and more like itinerant preachers. They just go from church to church preaching, collecting large offerings, living large, and then they'll see you again next year. I mean, you got to call this stuff for what it is because that's what's happening out there. I'm not making this up. Some people are going to see this later on. They're going to hate me, but I'm going to be dead and gone. It's going to be too late to mess with me. (laughs) And then verse 12, we labor working with our own hands. This is Apostle Paul. Being reviled, that is verbally abused, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. That is, we exhort. There's a number one in your Bible. If you have a spirit-filled life Bible, there's a number one in front of the word exhort. Look in the center column, find verse 13, and then find that little number one. It's the word exhort. So in other other words, he's saying while we're being um, um, uh, defamed, we we bless. We we, we lift up. We, We build people up. We encourage people. See, this is opposite kind of thinking. We have been as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. That's a serious resume for an overseer. Okay? That's a serious resume for an overseer. Yeah, I'll wait. I'll get finished. that you pay attention to me as best as you can. Okay? All right. Okay, turn back to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. Everybody there? All right, page 88, about the middle of the page. Here, Peter is the, not the OG, but the OP. Y'all know what the OG is? <laughs> All right. I'm glad y'all say that. Anyway, he's the OP. He's the original. <laughs> All right. All right. So he's the original apostle. Uh, and Peter identifies himself in three ways in verse 1. What are they? Verse 1, what three ways does the Apostle Peter identify himself? Right there in verse 1. Get the microphone. A fellow elder, a witness, and a partaker. Okay. 
a fellow elder, a witness, and a partaker. That's how he introduces himself. So the personal, practical question would be, how do we introduce ourselves to people? Do we introduce ourselves with our titles, with all the things we've accomplished, or do we introduce ourselves from a point of humility? I'm here to serve. I'm here to serve. we're reading this word and we're learning the lesson, then it shouldn't be that difficult for us to pick up on, on the lessons that we can learn and incorporate them in our lives. Okay? All right. Um, bottom question on page 88. What instructions are being given to the elders in verse 2? What instructions? This is the exhortation, which are instructions from the apostle Peter to the elders. Verse 2. Grab the microphone, pull it up, start speaking. Shepherd the flock. Okay. Shepherd the flock of God. That's the instruction. The apostle Peter is telling the elders to shepherd the flock of God. That word shepherd there has to do with feeding. You remember when Jesus told Peter, if you love me, do what? Feed my sheep. Ask him three times, same question. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Feed. That's what shepherds do. We're going to talk a little bit more about that a little bit later on. So, so Peter's instructions to the elders who were the overseers slash bishops, they were to shepherd the flock of God. What's the second or the next instruction that he gives in verse 2? Serving. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. An overseer is not to be served. An overseer is to serve. That's what it says right here. This is the job description. An overseer is to serve. He's to serve the flock of God which should be primary responsibility, primary attention given to feeding the flock. Now, I don't, I don't call names and stuff, but, but currently I'm aware of a situation where a pastor is thinking about leaving the church, retiring, not leaving, retiring, and been there over 20 years, but has nobody in the waiting. And so the understanding is, well, I'll just, when I leave, I'm sure the denomination will just go ahead and assign a pastor to that church. That may not mean much to you all, but it means a lot to me. How can I, as a shepherd, just walk away from my sheep, hoping that another shepherd will come and feed the sheep. Now, um, I planted a church in another city before coming here. I was there for a number of years, and when I got called to come here, <coughs> um, the last two Sundays before we came, I didn't preach. We talked about the possibility of the move. The denomination called me and asked me to come over here. I said, let me talk to my people first. And so we talked about it for two Sundays. And the de part of the determination was how many of you would be willing to go. If the majority of you are willing to go, I will go. If the majority of you are not willing to go, I'm not going. Why? Because I care about the sheep. Then when they first called me, they called me on a Friday evening and said, listen, we want you to go over to the church on Sunday morning. I said, excuse me? They must didn't know about me. And, um, and so I said to them, well, what's going to happen my, to my congregation? They said, oh, don't worry about it. We'll get somebody over there. 
if I didn't have the mindset that I had, I would have said, okay. But I'm not going to leave my sheep just because you say go. Go, go. go over here. To, you know, to fill in for you because whatever, whatever. Uh-uh. So, so I said, listen, I'll tell you what. Don't call me. I'll call you. And I hung up the phone. Because that was completely out of order for them to ask me to do something like that. If I didn't know that, I'd have said yes. Oh, wow, another opportunity. No. I got to care for my sheep first. So before we left, we found out who was going to go and who was going to stay. And I made it my business to get everybody who didn't want to come over here plugged into a church in the city because I was tied in with the pastor there. So I knew who was who and who was doing what. So I said, okay, well, you'll be fit better over here. You'll fit over here. And I got all but one family plugged into a church before I left. And the one family that was undecided came over here a couple of times, but then realized the drive was too far. And so I tried to stay in touch with them even after that, but then they fell off the, off the, cli- off the grid. Okay, and so I couldn't do nothing about that. But, but my heart was to make sure that every one of the sheep were taken care of. Hello. That's what shepherds do. That's what shepherds do. Now, if I'm a hireling, if I'm just in it for the money or the prestige or the power or the position, then I, I, I would have I would done something completely different. But I'm not a hireling. I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor. Jesus gave that to me. Men might give other titles, but Jesus gave me the gift of being a shepherd, a pastor, a feeder. That's not all. That's part. Okay? So Peter is exhorting the elders, the overseers of the church to shepherd the flock, feed them, and serve them. Most overseers want to be served. Y'all with me? Hello? Yeah, most, most overseers want to be served. But Jesus said, if we're following his model, what, what did he, does anybody remember what he said about serving? Can somebody tell me that? Just grab a mic and tell me what he said about serving. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you got to be the servant of all. Okay, great. That's one good one. There's another good one that Jesus said about himself. Grab the microphone. Pick up your cross and follow me. Yes, but there's another something really, right, what he said about himself. He says, I didn't come to to be served. I came to serve. I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. So if we're truly following Jesus' model, There ought to be more servants in the church. Shepherds who serve the flock. That's what we're supposed to do. Okay? I'm just reading the Bible now. Get get mad at me, throw something at me. It's just the Bible. (laughs) Your problem is with the Bible, not with me. Here we go. Bless you. All right, here we go. (coughs) So, So feeding the flock or shepherding the flock. Like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Okay. Top of page 89. Top of page 89. Did you happen to notice that the elders, the elders are receiving instruction? Isn't that interesting? Right? And so elders nowadays, in some circles, you can't correct an elder. They'll say, don't you know who I am? can't talk to me like that. you just a peon in the church. Uh-uh. But Peter is instructing the elders, which means every elder, every overseer has to be open to instruction. Okay? Nobody is above the word. Nobody. I don't care what our title is. We're not above what the word teaches us. Very good. All right? That's what it says in the book, Palatizia. No one, no matter their rank or title, is above the instructions of the word of God. What is the next part of the instructions to the elders in verse 2? Shepherd, serving, and what else? Serve how? Grab.
Grab the microphone. Grab the microphone. In the back. In the back. Go ahead. Go ahead. Not by compulsion, but willingly. Not, you went too far. Serving as overseers. Serving as overseers. How do we serve? We're called to serve, but how do we serve? As overseers. Okay? As overseers. And that will be addressed, too, in, here in a few uh, moments. Serving as an overseer. Not a big-time boss, but an overseer. All right? And, um, <clears throat> and so an overseer... Again, is a steward or a household manager. A steward or a household manager. So the elder is to shepherd the flock, feed the flock as a household manager. He's to make sure that everybody, as much as possible, is being taken care of being cared for, is being fed. Everybody got that? Okay. Now we're going to have, we got a few minutes. Let's, I want you now, what are the guidelines and safeguards for overseers? Next question is there on page 18. There are about six different things. Six different things. What are the guidelines and safeguards for overseers? I hope you all are following this at home, those of you who are watching. All right. We're in verse 2 and verse 3. We're going to cover those two verses. What are the guidelines and safeguards for overseers? It's Microphone. not by compulsion. Say that again. Not by compulsion. Not by compulsion. That's force or pressure. But willingly. See, we need we need somebody to fill this slot, and we don't have a lot of time, so we gotta appoint somebody. So uh, we need you to just step in there and do that. That's compulsion. What's the next one? Willingly. Huh? Willingly. But willingly. Willingly. There's a number one in front of the word willingly. If you have a spirit-filled life Bible, look in the center column, find verse number two. Find that little number one. What does it say? According to God. According to God. In other words, we serve as overseers, not by compulsion, but according to God's prompting, according to God's call, according to God's leading. So overseers should be occupying that position in response to God ministering to their heart. Speaking that to them, that this is what I, I'm calling you to do and to be, to be and to do. And so it's according to God. We don't just self-appoint. We don't appoint ourselves to a position because we like, we like the prestige, we like the power, we like the attention, we like the money, we like the this, the that, and the other. No. It should be because God is the one that's calling you to that. And sometimes, in fact, the church that I got saved in a long time ago, um, uh, I, had, I was there about nine, ten years, and, and I left and, and moved on and uh, went back to visit a couple of times, and there was these four young brothers that uh, I kind of was working with when I was there, and they had become young men at the time. And there was a new pastor there at the church, and he was a very exciting preacher, very inspirational and all of that. And all of a sudden, these four dudes who had not really been walking with God, all of a sudden, I'm called to preach. So I said, who called you to preach? How do you know you called to preach? How do you know? And many of them couldn't tell me how they know. But they felt called to preach. And I knew sometimes, you know, when people are kind of following from afar off, and not up close to Christ. And sometimes that unction that people feel is God is trying to tell you, listen, I need you to come closer to me. I want you to be more committed to me. All right? But they misread that by thinking that God was calling them to preach because they were, they were motivated by this new pastor in, in, uh, in the church. And he was an exciting guy. I mean, he could preach. 
So I can see how they were motivated, and that's why I asked the question, how do you know you're called to preach? And they couldn't answer me. And the proof became true a couple of years later where all of them had fallen out of, pre out of, out of the ministry because they weren't supposed to be there in the first place. Now, if I had been there, I could have kind of picked them up before they fell, but I, was, I wasn't there any longer. And so, again, reading these promptings, again, it's according to God. It's God's will. It's God's call. It's God's prompting. It's God's urging. That's how we know we're supposed to do something. Okay? And so that's, that's, that's kind of what this willingly is about. All right? It's not just somebody who says, okay, I'll do it. But it's somebody who's responding to God's call. That's what this willingly is about. Everybody got that? I hope so. See, if you try to remember this stuff and don't write it down, it'll be gone next week. All right, so I'm through with that. What's the next thing? What's the next guideline or safety net? Not for dishonest gain. Not for dishonest gain. Would you say some of the shenanigans that goes on in churches, especially during offering time and conferences and conventions, do you think some of that might fall under this umbrella of dishonest gain? Huh? Yeah. Yes, it is. Because they're manipulating the people of God to get the money. And so they extend the offering period longer than the sermon. <laughs> They'll spend 45 minutes to an hour raising the offering, and it was 30-minute sermon. Come on now. So they're telling you right up front which is more important to them. So dishonest gain. Now, people who raise these Big offerings, they're not going to ever refer to it as dishonest gain. They're they going to call it sowing into good soil, sowing into my ministry. And so they have a nice way to cover it up. And people who don't know any better, Christians who don't know any better, will fall prey to the pressure. But over there in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says don't give grudgingly or of necessity. Anybody remember them two words? But give willingly. And cheerfully, grudgingly, and, and, and somebody's pressuring you and you're trying to give, and then necessity means people are actually putting pressure on you to give. That's what that word necessity means. And so if somebody's, if you're feeling somebody pressuring you and pressuring you to give offerings and give money and so forth and so on, if you haven't made up in your mind that you're going to give and they're pressuring you, he says you don't have to respond to that pressure. And you don't have to feel guilty about not giving. I've been in a bunch of them services. I, I say, okay, I'm gonna give this, and they, well, we we didn't reach our we didn't reach our goal, so we gonna we gonna take a few more minutes and let the Lord speak to your heart. They got all kind of nice ways to get people to excuse me to get their hand in your pocket. But this is the shepherd, the overseer does not serve for dishonest gain. You're not in the ministry for the money. If that was the case, I'd have quit a long time ago. Are you listening? A long time ago. Now, I know how to do what they were doing, but I'm not going to play with the people of God. I'm not going to manipulate them to try to get more money out of them. If you're going to give something, give it. If you ain't going to give it, that's between you and God. Hello? God is going to find a way to take care of me, which he has all of these years. But dishonest game. What's another one? Guideline. But eagerly. Serving eagerly. Oh, my God. Not, 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 not. <laughs> Man, I sure don't feel like going to church there. But you the pastor. <laughs> you, you, you can't feel like not going to church when you the pastor, you the overseer. You, you, you got to wake up eager to get there. Why? Because you spent time with the Lord and you've gotten something from him to feed the flock. And so you're excited about giving that stuff away because you know it's going to build people up. It's going to make them stronger. It's going to reach, help them reach their maturity in Christ. And so here is be, be eager about serving as an overseer. Eager. 
But there are a lot of pastors who go to church and it's, 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 it's burdensome to them. It's, it's a chore to them. Many pastors got all kind of stuff going on inside, medical issues and what have you, because they're not eagerly approaching this stuff. If God called you to do it, how can you not be eager to do it? But you got to put in some time and some work. What's the next one? In verse 3. Nor lords over those entrusted to you. Not being lords over those who are entrusted to you. <laughs> Not being lords over those entrusted to you. And so what does it mean to be lord over someone? Anybody know what that means? I know you've heard it. Like yes. not acting like they're mini gods. A mini god, okay. Taskmaster. Um. <laughs> that was a voice from heaven, y'all. Amen. <laughs> not trying to be an apostle with a capital A, right? Okay. <laughs> Don't forget the context of that, else you, it could be misunderstood what I said. All right. So here again, it's saying not being lords over the people who entrusted you. So, so again, it's a heavy-handed boss. It's a taskmaster kind of a boss. It's what, somebody who wants to whip people in shape and rebuke you every time you do something wrong. That's, that's not a shepherd. When I came here, that's kind of what had been going on. I didn't know it because I wasn't here. But people were waiting for me to rebuke them. And I'm saying, why? Because that's what's been happening. I said, well, if you do something crazy, then I will rebuke you. But I'm not going to rebuke you because you make a mistake. A well-intended mistake. That, that doesn't call for a rebuke. So, so when people, again, and I, I, I know this, but when people are misused or abused, they think that if they're not being abused, that you don't love them. Did you guys know that? Yeah. If that's what they're used to and you don't treat them that way, they think you don't love them. If you're not slapping them upside the head and hollering and screaming at them and all this kind of other stupid stuff. So, so you can see people need help. They really need help. They need to be rooted and grounded in the word so that they are strong enough to deal with this stuff, recognize this stuff, and not be a victim of this kind of stuff. Yeah. The word will raise you up in there. So these being lords over them are heavy-handed taskmasters, control freaks. Everything's got to go their way. Everything's got to happen when they say it's got to happen and this, that, and the other. They have to come up with all of the main good ideas and nobody else's ideas that important and all of these other things that, that come under this covering of being a lord over them. Jesus was not that to the disciples. So again, whose example are we following today? Those who are in church leadership. Whose example are we following? Are we following our favorite preacher? Are we following our friends, our acquaintances? Are we following Jesus? You decide. Then F, what does it say? The next one? By being examples to the flock. Hmm. So shepherds are supposed to be what? Examples. How am I, as a church member, going to know how to behave, how to carry myself, how to pray, how to praise, how to worship, how to give, how to go witnessing, how to do any of those things that the Christian community is expected to do? How are we going to know how to do that? The shepherd is supposed to be the example. The overseer is supposed to be the example. This is Bible. It ain't me. Get mad at me, throw it up. You can turn me off if you want to, but this is Bible. And so I have nobody in particular in mind. This is just across the Christian community at large in America. That's my focus. Be examples to the flock. Isn't that something? Now, why are these guidelines important for the overseer? Right there on page 89 of your study guide. 
why are these guidelines important for the overseer? Again, the overseer is the apostle, the bishop, the pastor, the elder. Why are these guidelines important? Because they need to be the example to the flock. Okay. Very good. Anybody say it differently? To be examples to the flock? It's a reminder to be an example to the flock. What, can anybody say it any, any differently? Okay, let me give you a couple of things. All right. Because it's the job description of an overseer. That's why it's important. It's the job description. When you get hired, hopefully they'll give you a description of what they expect you to do. If you don't have that job description and they're not asking you to write your own job description, you're going to do whatever makes sense to you. Is that correct? Yeah. So it, it's the job description. And then secondly, it keeps overseers on track. It lets me know if I'm on track or off track. It lets me know if I'm drifting away. And so these guidelines are important to keep me on track. And if I lose sight of them, I'm going to do what makes sense to me. And, 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 and Christ will not be the center or the reason or the purpose why I'm doing what I'm doing because I got off track. I'm, I'm missing the job description. And if you don't do the job description on your job, they give you a raise. <laughs> yeah, raise on up out of here. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, last question on 89. We're going to close out. Why would these guidelines be important for them to follow? Babe? <laughs> Let me just give you the answer. I hate doing this, but I'm going to give it to you. So that they don't establish their own rules. So that they don't establish their own rules or job description and or accountability. I'll say it all again. The reason why these guidelines are important so that overseers don't establish their own rules or their own job description, and it's for accountability measures. Hmm. See, if we don't know this, we can't hold people accountable. All right? It's important that we get a hold of that all of us be learning the word, that the overseers know what their role and responsibility is, and then we find out as members in the church what our role and responsibility is. We got to stay close to the job description. Everybody got that? All right. Any questions about what we talked about? Comments? Microphone. Uh, who assigned the job of the elder? Like, who assigned the elder? Is the, the pastor. The, the pastor. So then, the pastor? So in, the pa the, in the local church, yes. Okay. If this was another denomination, it would probably be a bishop. So that's why, as members, our responsibility is really to pray for the pastor because they have a big job to do. Yes. Because he he could he should not get this wrong. If he gets it wrong, then it affects a lot of stuff. So if we 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 really we really need to be praying for the pastor to 100%. make the um, right calls on this this kind of stuff because he has to ensure that this the the elders. Uh, in this church, we are very, very blessed because our elders, I was thinking about the, like if they check ma, and our elders check to my natural eyes. Wow, right. 
a check boxes on what we got over here going right. back. You can bet it's a lot of cases that we don't know. That's that's exactly right. Yeah, and, I, and again, I, I said it this morning. I thought I said it earlier, but I'll say it again that our elders here, you know, are pretty much on point. Okay, um, <clears throat> but I know a lot of places where it's a title game. So they get the they get the accolades, they get the recognition, but you know what are they doing? And so if we don't know what the guidelines and the instructions and job description is, then people will do what makes sense to them. Okay. In the meantime, the church will be uh, not as strong or mature as it could be because the overseers are obviously missing the job description. All right. Um, <coughs> so this is this is another list of the job descriptions that Christ expects for those that he appoints as overseers in the church. Ephesians 4 is another one. That's the primary one. But these are ones that these elders, these apostles are actually saying, which is in agreement with what Jesus said, is what we're supposed to be doing. Okay? All right. So we'll talk more about the feeding part of the shepherding next time. Okay? All right. <coughs> okay. So again, I say to you each week, if you have any questions, write them down. If you go back over this between now and next week and you have some questions, if you can get here again on time, we will take the first couple of minutes to answer some questions and then jump right into our lesson for the evening, okay? So we will stop there at verse 3, and we'll pick up there uh, next, next week, Lord said so. All right, okay, with that, let's bow in prayer, make sure that everybody signs the sign-in sheet. And also, uh, the offering basket is up front. Feel free to put as many uh, thousands in there as you would like. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, um, uh, I want to pray for, uh, I know it's already happened, but, you know, and I know other people have been praying. I've been praying already. But I want to pray for Shaylin and for Brother Crawford and for Sister um, Kelly as they prepare to leave this weekend, I believe it is, to go on the trip to, uh, Af mission trip to Africa. All right. So uh, let's stand together. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together tonight. As we have willfully submitted ourselves to your feet to learn from you. Your word, O oh God, is clear when it's presented as such. We're not learning this, Lord, to be critical. We're learning it to be aware and to know how to pray for our leaders. And more importantly, to make sure that we understand our role and responsibility and that we're following through on our role and responsibility. And so easy, Lord, is it for us to point fingers at somebody else and, and, and not look at you know, what we might be doing or might not be doing. But, Lord, I thank you for everyone who's serving in this church, everyone who's helping, who's giving, who's praying, who's doing all that they know to do to make this church what it ought to be. But all of it should not rest upon the shoulders of the pastor, Lord. It, it's He's the overseer, and he's to make sure that everything is happening that's supposed to happen, but we're the ones to make it happen. And so help us, Lord, to look at ourselves before we point fingers at anybody else, oh God. And Lord, we thank you for this ministry and for the leadership of this ministry. And we pray that you continue to bless them, oh God, and enrich them deep in your spirit, oh God, in every sense of what that means, so that they can lead the church and oversee the happenings of the church as they should. And Father God, we thank you too for the missionary team that's about to launch and go back to Africa. We pray for Sister Kelly and for Sister Shaylin and for Brother Crawford, oh God, that you will protect them on every side, that you will dispatch strong and warring angels, oh God, to attend their way, Father, to protect them and, and, and to provide for them, oh God, and give them fruit for their labor, Father. I pray that the word that they preach or teach would be like fire, oh God, coming from their mouth that would penetrate deeply into the hearts of the hearer, O oh God, and that you will somehow overcome what might be a language barrier, Lord, so that they understand by the Spirit what is being said and what's being preached and what's being taught and what's being prayed. And so, Father, we're thanking you in advance for fruit. 
Hallelujah. Fruit that will remain, O oh God. And so watch over them, Lord, going and while they're there and coming back to land safely on these lands, O oh God, that they might come back and share the testimony of the great things that the Lord is doing. And so we bless you now. We thank you for them. We know that you're going to care for them and be with them. And so, Lord, we are excited about all of that. And we together as a church, Lord, just link our arms together. We link our faith together to pray for them every day that they're away, oh God. Hallelujah. We don't know what's going on from day to day. But the enemy will be there. But it's not going to sway them, Lord, because you have given them power over every power of the enemy. Hallelujah. And so I pray that they exercise that with boldness, oh God, and by the Spirit. We thank you for it now. Bless us now as we leave this place, but never from your presence. Bring us back together again at the appointed time. We promise to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody in agreement said amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, all right, all right. Hallelujah. Hmm.